It's good to be again on Sunday morning in worship with you. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And that song, There's No Friend Like Jesus, or We'll Never Have a Friend as Close to Us as Jesus, is a great application to this passage. The passage here is about singleness and marriage, as many of us might find this relatable because we're either single or we're married. We're one or the other. And this is a great lesson on some of the practical advice that God has give, is going to give to us. And so let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we're going to be in verse 1 through 7, speaking on this topic. It says, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for men not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. Husband should give his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. But the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, as a concession... Now the command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. It's about in the word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this wonderful passage and this wonderful morning which we get to sing songs to prepare our hearts for this message. We know, Lord, that everything points to you, whether we're single, whether we're married, we're to find our satisfaction in you and you alone. And yet, there are certain practical steps that we need to take in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for this very interesting and yet very pertinent passage for us for, to, to learn from. We pray that we learn much from this. Help us, Lord, to be engaged with you and engage what the Holy Spirit has to teach us. Help us to know what we need to change about our own lives so that we may live our lives pleasing to you, Lord, for your glory. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whether we're single or married, the truth is that we are facing a greater and greater problem of loneliness in our lives. According to Pew Research Center, about 53% of Americans today are married, and that is on a decline. Just a decade ago, it was about 58%. Californians are about 51% married, that is among adults from age 15, or age 18 rather, to age 54. That was 74% in 1960s. In the same period, those who are single had doubled in percentage. And we asked the question, why are Americans opting for singleness versus marriage? There are several reasons why. The main reason being financial. People feel that they're not financially ready to have a married life. They need to get their careers, need to get their education in place before they consider marriage. And when they do do so, a lot of times the career or the education kind of take over and eventually you're not married and you're already 30, 40 years old and some people are opting to not to get married at all at that point. Even though we do delay marriage, Americans have delayed marriages, the reality is that our biological clocks continue to tick. We feel the desire to be with somebody. We feel the sexual desire to be with somebody ever since we hit puberty. That is true. We have the sexual urges in us, and we have the desire to be with another person. And if we're not going to do it in the setting of marriage, then the reality is that we're going to do it in the setting of being unmarried. We're going to be unmarried and still live as if we're married with a person. That causes certain problems to our lives. You see, God created marriage and God created sexual relationships to be fulfilled within a setting of marriage. When two people are together in that intimate way, our bodies produce certain chemicals, a chemical called oxytocin, which binds two people together. It has strong psychological and physiological effects to cause you to be bound to that person. It's wonderful when you are with that person, you feel calm, you feel at peace, you feel joy in your life. And when you're not with that person, that chemical causes havoc to your life, cause you to be jealous, cause you to be envy, cause you to be depressed, cause you to be sad, cause you to be in pain. And you don't know where it's coming from, except maybe you blame the person, but the reality is that we have lived our lives apart from God's design. Even though we have sex, 
with people and perhaps with multiple people, the reality is that we are lonelier than ever. So we say marriage then. Perhaps you get married and that will fix everything. Well, marriage doesn't fix everything either because it really depends on who you marry, does it not? That person you marry may not be the person you imagine that person to be. It could be a person who is abusive towards you. It could be a person who is physically abusive, verbally abusive. It could be drug use in that relationship. It could be infidelity in that relationship. You're married to the person who is not kind to you. You're married to this person who is not faithful to you. And now you're stuck with this person. As a result, even though you're married, you're still lonely. You're lonelier than when you're single, even though you're married. So marriage and singleness are not a solution to loneliness in our lives. The only solution to our lives regarding loneliness, regarding being peace, at peace and being satisfied, is God himself. See, Psalm chapter 16, verse 11 says this regarding God. You have made known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Our God designed for us to find peace in him. Our God designed for us to find satisfaction in Him, in Him alone. And even though He did do that, even though He calls us to have that, He actually designed for each one of us to find that satisfaction in a setting of being single or in a setting of being married. God had created singleness. Did you know that? When you're first born, you are single. God didn't make you into a married person the moment you're born. When you're born, when you're made, when you're in this earth, at first you are single. It's a wonderful, wonderful setting. And then God also created the opportunity for marriage. He gave Adam a wife, gave Eve a husband. There's a setting for marriage, and certainly that is wonderful as well. However, the reality is that sin entered into the world. We chose to follow sin instead of follow God, and we know what sin is. Sin is that hurtful action, that hurtful word. Sin is that, that, that ugly action, that ugly word. It's envy, strife, anger, infidelity, unfaithfulness. And because of it, we ruin our lives. You have that in a single relationship. You ruined your singleness. You're supposed to live a life of contentment and joy unto the Lord in your singleness, and you don't have it because of sin. You're supposed to live a life of faithfulness and commitment to God and to one another in the, uh, in the setting of marriage, and you don't have that because of sin. So sin ruined our lives. Not only did it ruin our physical lives here today, it also ruins our eternal life because God will judge sin. According to Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, God lists out all the sins that he will judge. He says this, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, which is the second death. So God will judge sin. So our lives here are ruined because of sin. Our eternal lives are ruined because of sin. However, the other reality is that God is always his love. You see, God loves us and cares for us. He's seeking to restore us. He's not just going to restore us forever in heaven, but he wants to restore us here on earth as well. He wants to restore us both physically and spiritually. And that is through the Son, Jesus Christ, because we must understand all the problems which you face in this world is because of sin. Because sin entering the world, we face the effects of sin, even though we are thinking about effects of sin as a problem, but the source of the effects of sin is sin in and itself. So Jesus came to deal with that problem. Jesus came and he gave his perfect life to us. He lived the perfect life so that we may have that perfect life. And he died on the cross to pay for the punishment that's due you and due me for our sins so that we don't have to pay for the punishment anymore. Our God is a holy and a righteous God. We will have to pay that punishment if it's not for Jesus who paid the punishment for us on the cross. And he died. He rose again after he died so that he may show us that he will lead us to eternity with him. If we believe unto Jesus, we will have eternal life. That eternal life is not just lived out today or in eternity, but it's also lived out today. You get to live a life fully committed to the Lord. You get to live a life of righteousness and peace. You get to live a life in which you're in right relationship with God. That is what God promises. And so because of Jesus, our lives changed. Our lives are with him. As a result of that, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, we're to live with a transformed mind. We're to live with a transformed heart. We're no longer to live in a way that is captured by the things of this world. 
but be transformed by the renewal of our mind, by the testing, so that we may discern what is the will of God, what is good and perfect in His will for us. So in the setting of singleness and marriage, God has given us commands here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you're single, God has given some commands to you, some practical commands that you can learn from here in this passage. If you're married, God has also given you some practical commands in which you can learn from. However way that you are, whether you're single or married, you're to find your contentment in the Lord. Now, we must look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in such a way that we understand that these are practical commands. God is being very practical here. He's giving you some practical ways of living so that you may live your life for the Lord. And the first practical command is this for the single. If you're single today, you may consider marriage as an option, but be married in God's way. You may consider marriage as an option for you that is marriage in God's way. Let's look at verse 1 through 2. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man shall have his own wife, each woman her own husband. As we come to this passage, we know that Paul is in a letter to the Corinthians. We've been in the Corinthians for the last few months, and this is a wonderful letter God has written to the Corinthian church to encourage the Corinthian church to live lives of holiness unto the Lord. The Corinthian church is struggling holiness. We know that. Ever since from the beginning of the book of Corinthians, we know that the church has been struggling in a matter of pride and in a matter of sexual morality. It's been struggling with a lot of things. It's not hard for us to imagine the church is struggling because the church is birthed from a city that is highly immoral. The city is on a little strip of land called the Isthmus. It's got ports on either side connecting the Asian Sea to the Ionian Sea. As a result, this is a very, very busy city. People come in and out of the city all the time. And because people do that, literally, you can just go into the city, do whatever it is you want in the city. You can have the fear in the city. The news will never, ever reach home. People can do whatever it is in the city. Whatever happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. Not only so, on top of the city, on the Acropolis, there is a temple offered to the goddess Aphrodite. This particular temple is a temple offered to this goddess of love. And it's not a love that is noble of sacrificial kind, but rather a love that is erotic in nature. The 1,000 priests that work in this temple offering their bodies as religious prostitutes to the people who will come to this temple. So this is where the church of Corinth was born. And you can imagine as Paul is building this church, he had to instruct the people of this church that no, the, the reality that God's view of sexuality is, is different, completely different than what they're used to. They're used to just sleeping around, used to have sexual immoral uh, conduct with anybody whenever they want, however they want, with whoever they want. But Paul is saying there are a way which God designed for us to live. There is a particular way in which sexual relations is to happen as to happen within the confines of marriage. According to Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, God says this, Therefore man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is a setting of marriage. You shall become one flesh with your husband. You shall, have one flesh with, you shall become one flesh with your wife. As a result, in the confines of marriage, once you get married, you get to have that. You get to enjoy that. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 through 19 says this, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight and be intoxicated always in her love. You are to enjoy your spouse. That's what God is teaching. However, this is something that is difficult for people to accept. The reality is that people say, well, sexual relationships are just done with people who are consensual. And if you're consensual, certainly that is fine. But God says, no, I've set up certain rules in terms of my creation. I desire for you to, offer, I desire for you to follow these rules. These are the rules for you. This is what's best for you. It's best for you because I designed for humanity to live in this way. This is what is holy. This is what is righteous. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 10 says this, Do you not know that an unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. God says, you know what? I don't need the answer to you. I don't need to tell you why. I'm just going to tell you just the way it is because it's how I designed for you to be in the very beginning. So you just need to listen and obey. He lists three categories of sexual immoral categories. 
He says this, there is the first sexually immoral, which is a broad category. Anything outside the confines of marriage, any sexual activity outside the confines of marriage is considered sexually immoral to God. And you are not to have this in your life as a pattern. We might all fall into sin at some point in our lives in this category, but the reality is that we're not to fall into sin as a pattern of our lives in this category. Nor are there to be adulterers. Adulterers is a subset of sexual immorality. It's two people having sexual relationships, but they're not married to each other, while they're, one of them is already married to another person. You break in the marriage vow, so therefore you're adulterers. And there are those who practice homosexuality. Homosexuality is two people having that sexual relationship, but they're of the same biological gender. That is not God's design either. According to Genesis chapter 2, verse 22, God says this, or the word of God says this, in the word in the rib that the Lord God taken from the man, he made into woman and brought her to the man. So even from the creative design from the very beginning in the book of Genesis, we see that God created man for woman and woman for man. That is it. And we're called to live in such a way. God says this, if you have these sins in your life as a pattern of your life, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. God will judge. God will judge. But then God also says, such were some of you. You're cleansed. You're saved. This no longer should be part of your life. So it matters for us in eternity that why we should not live our lives in such a way. It also matters to us now because our lives could be destroyed if we live in a way that is opposite of what God calls us to live because there's something special about sexual sins. This is something that we talked about last week. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 says this, he says we're to flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. There's something spiritual, something special about sins that is in sexual nature because you remember it, right? You might steal some from somebody. You might hurt somebody physically. You might hurt somebody with words. Years later, you don't remember it anymore, but you do remember that specific time that you had that sexual immoral act with that other person. Some people remember it for years and years and years. 20 years you still remember it. There's something that sticks with you regarding sexual immorality. It's something that hurts you, brings you pain, brings you sorrow. And Paul says this, I want you to be aware of this. I want you to flee from this. I want you to be aware of the danger of this. So if you're aware of the danger of this, you wouldn't even want to touch it. Flee from sexual immorality. There's great physiological and psychological effects which is done to you as a result of this sin. So as a result of this, Paul has been encouraging the Corinthian church. If you know anything about the church, of uh, the letter of 1 Corinthians, actually the second letter Paul has written to the Corinthian church. The first letter is lost. We don't know where it is, but it's a letter which Paul has written to the Corinthian church addressing this specific issue about sexual immorality. So now the Corinthian church are writing back to Paul and says, you know what, if sex is so bad, if sexual relationships are so bad, maybe it's best for us not to have sexual relationships at all in our lives. This is what's seen in verse 1 of, first, of chapter 7. Now concerning matters about which you wrote, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. They're swinging too far on the other side. Paul is saying, hey, don't have immoral sexual relations and then people are coming back. Well, maybe that's just not have sex at all not just not have sexual relationships at all and paul says no that's on the other side which i don't want you to be in it's a problem of our society problem of our own hearts right we either are anarchists we either are liberalists we either are those who don't care about god's law and say you know what i don't want to live my life according to god's rules i'm going to do whatever i want or on the other side we become pharisees we're those who are moralists we say you know we're better than you because we don't do this we don't do that so you look down on people who does that and who do that and and um and you think yourself is better. So either a legalist that on the other side or a liberalist, one or the other. And Paul says, no, you need to know what God's heart is. God created you with sexual parts. So therefore, you can actually use that for the glory of God. It's a good thing. You're supposed to talk about it in an honest and, 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 a, and a wonderful and a beautiful way. Sex is created to honor God. See, a lot of times when we think about sex as a dirty thing, and we think about it in our minds, we're the only one, we're the first one to fall into that, right? You're the, you're the politician that, all, that seems so upright, and all of a sudden they found you to be in some prostitution ring. It's, it happens all the time. You're the Catholic priest who doesn't get married, thinks it's bad for you, but then you have all these secret sins in your life that is sexual. 
You're that parent that don't ever talk about sex to your children. You think it's a dirty thing, but then your children are growing up, they have these sexual urges, they don't know where to find answers to them. Do you know where they go? Google. They type in more sex, and what do they find? Don't do it. Pornography. They get educated in that way. So sex is something that is beautiful, and God's actually called us even today to talk about it in a beautiful and not a crude way, but in a beautiful and wonderful way, knowing that this is what God's created us to have and to know how to operate in a way that honors the Lord. And Paul is actually being very honest here. Paul says, you know what? I just want to be honest to you. I'm not going to be that parent that never talks about it and eventually leave you to find it out on your own. I'm going to tell you very honestly that you're going to have sexual urges. You will. In fact, you should thank God for them. You should thank God for your sexual urges. You know, why did I thank God for my sexual urges? The reason why you need to thank God for your sexual urges is this. You are going to be a great husband. You are going to be a great wife because of these urges. These urges will cause you to be that great husband and great wife when you utilize them within the setting of marriage. It's wonderful. However, However, if you're going to delay the marriage, if you're going to pursue your career, if you're going to do whatever it is you want to do, if you're not going to focus on getting married, if you're not going to pursue a woman or you don't, let be, you don't want to be pursued, you're going to just cut it off from your life at that moment, what are you going to do with these urges? And Paul says, you know what? If you don't deal with them in the way that God wants you to deal with them, then these urges actually become temptation for you because you need to express them solely in the setting of marriage and you are not married. So therefore, you need to put away or to let the urges go away on its own. Now, Paul says, I just want to give you some practical advice. It's not easy. It's not easy. We all know this, right? You're going to have these urges like, you know what? It's not just, oh, it's just right there. What do I do with it? What do I do with it? Paul says, one simple answer. Seek to get married. Get married. Get married so that you can actually exercise these urges in a setting which God wants you to exercise it. And that's found in verse 2. Because of temptation to sexual immorality, each man shall have his own wife, each woman her own husband. Get married. You say, well, how do I get married? That's a big question, right? I want to get married. And some of us say, well, I want to get married, but how do I get married? Well, let me tell you this thing. God can use a variety of different kind of processes. The process is actually the, not the most important thing to God. You know what's the most important thing to God? The person. The person. The person is the most important thing to God. You can have all kinds of processes. You can have the perfect process, but if the person is not the right person, you still will not accept the person into your life, right? But do you know that the other person is also looking for the right person as well? So you need to be the right person too, so the other person will be made looking for you. So both of you need to be the right person. So what kind of person we need to be? Paul actually instructs us in the, all throughout the book of the Bible. Actually, the whole entire book of the Bible is how to get married. Be the right person. Be the godly person God calls you to be, and God will provide the right person for you in his own setting, in his own time, in his own way. In 1 Corinthians, we even see this. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39 says that widows, if you want to get married, you must be married to someone who? Someone who is in the Lord, someone who is a believer, someone who loves Jesus like you do. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says this, We're not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You're not to look for unbelievers. You're to look for another person who loves Jesus like you in marriage. And so if you're going to look for that person, another person is also looking for that person, you need to be that person so other people will find you. So being the godly person in Christ is actually the biggest steps that you can make in terms of becoming married. And you can actually do that whether you're single or married. It's good for everything. Now with processes, God can bring a variety of different processes. You can be open to them. You can use them. For example, in the time of Corinth, they have arranged marriages, which is not something we have today in terms of parents arranging it. We could arrange it among friends. We'll talk about this later. But back in the days of Corinth, there's arranged marriages. Parents would look at the child and say, you know what, my child is of age. Let's find a wife for the child. And other sides of my wife, my, my daughter is at age. Let's find a husband for the child. Now, the child may be like, no, I'm too shy. You know, sometimes we feel like, you know what? And this is sometimes some of us feel like, man, I wish I were arranged marriage so I can just get arranged. I don't have to be worried about this thing. Sure, that's wonderful. But we're, we don't have that here in our world. We have some aspects like it, but we don't have it. Back in the days of Corinth, literally people just come together, families come together, they like, they like each other, and they say, you know what, we're going to bring these two people together, and we're going to help them build a family, we're going to put the finances into their lives so that they can actually build a family, and they will be set. It's a wonderful way of getting married. 
So we don't have that today. You're sort of on your own a little bit today. But then there's some help that you can get. For example, Karina and I got help. So how did I get help? Well, I got help because friends. Friends introduced us. We're part of the same church for a season. Now I was going to another church, and she was still out of that old church, but we still have the same friends. So we got invited to the same wedding. I was sitting at the same wedding table with her. I didn't even know who she was, but I didn't know anything that, you know, that's what the purpose is for, that my friends who were getting wedded was wanting to match us up. I didn't know that, so I talked to her a little bit and just eventually said, you know what, that was a good, nice lady, you know, and I just went about doing my own thing. They said, you know what, Richard didn't get it. So what happened? They invited us again together. Now we're in a dinner table with them. Now I was, oh, now I got it. So I, I start paying attention. So you know, I want to ask this girl out. She's very nice. She's very pretty. I want to ask her out to, be, uh, to pursue a relationship with her. Now, she wasn't ready. You see, she didn't know. Right? And I'm not that impressive kind of person. It's like, you know what? Like, look at him, right? It's like, why would I want to date him? So what did she do? She said, you know what? I wasn't sure, so I'm not, I'm not really sure. So her sister started telling her, hey, why don't you give him a chance? Her sister, I'm a little bit older. Her sister heard about me. Her friends who invited me over heard about me. So you know what? You should give Richard another look. It's nice, right? Give him another look. It's helpful. It's helpful. We're arranged in such a way. So she gave me another look. And then she said, yeah, he's actually kind of nice guy. He had a love for the Lord, and um, I can consider that. It's, you know, if we're just like, if I just met her, I'm trying to impress her with my, you know, abilities, I, I just won't be able to do it. But with friends, that kind of arrangement, that was helpful. Other people are looking for online dating, and that's helpful too. Some people have success with it. Some people have not, but it's a lot of work. I have two friends who found great wives through online dating. However way that you go about it, just be open. But to know this, if you're looking for someone in the Lord, they'll also be looking for someone in the Lord. So be the godly person that you're called to be, and God will make the process available for you. However way he does it, he will make it happen. I kind of think of a good friend of mine, and this is a, a friend after Karina got married, we had the chance to do premarital counseling with his friend and his wife. And this friend of mine is a successful man. He's tall, handsome. He's just a wonderful young man in Christ. And he's had a great career. But he's with us, you see. He's with us in a church plant. We just started our church plan as a previous ministry. We only had seven people when we started. My, my, my family and my, uh, and my uh, co-pastor's family and him and a couple other people. You know what? He's like, well, I'm in 25 years old, 23 years old or so, something like that. He said, I'm looking for a spouse. And you come to this church, there's nobody. There's nobody. So what do you do? So we say, you know what? Why don't you go to reality, right? Afternoon service. There's a lot of pretty girls there in reality. They went there for a season. He said, you know what? I'm not going to go there anymore. I'm not going to go there anymore. He's just not going for the right reason. He came back. And that is when he started, to, we started, he started telling me about this, little, this, this girl that he liked, that he met a while ago. And now she's a believer. And we helped him text a message to her. And she texts back. It was an awkward message. But eventually they got together. And it wasn't because they had a wonderful approach. Because she saw that he loved the Lord. And he also saw that she loved the Lord. And so God works out all things according to his perfect plan. Even in that small church where there's no other ladies, God still brought the lady to him because he was a godly young man. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says this as well, that we're to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. Just seek after the Lord. Do his work. Serve him. Be the godly person you need to be, and God will make a way for you. That's the hardest part, being the godly person. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10 says this, An excellent wife who can find, she's far more precious than jewels. She is. But I can say the same thing about a husband. An excellent man who can find, he's more precious than gold. Find an excellent man here in Hollywood. Try that. Try that. It's hard, right? But be that person. This is what church is all about. We need to be a factory, a, producting, a production of what? Godly women and godly men. Eventually, as they're produced, they find each other. This is how the flourishing church looks like. There need to be marriages happening in this church because of the godly qualities of our people. So we see here, if you are single, and especially if you're, if you're, you're, if you're having these urges to get married, if you have sexual urges, do consider marriage. Consider marriage. Be the godly person God calls you to be and God... We'll bring that person if he wants you to be married. It is in his will. All you can do is wait unto the Lord. 
But the best you could do is to be the godly person. And being a godly person is beneficial for you anyhow. Beneficial for you being single, beneficial for being married. And when you're godly, you're content in the Lord as well. But this is the process of marriage. Be who God wants you to be. So consider marriage if you're single. But Paul is going to give further instruction for those who are married. He says if you're married then, if you're single and got married, or if you're already married, you need to consider this. You need to consider your spouse physically. You need to care for your spouse physically. We see this in verse 3 to 5. It says, The husband shall give it to his wife, conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourself to prayer and come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, come to this passage, Paul is just being very, very vivid, very, very clear. He's just not putting around, beating around the bush, saying this is what you need to be to your husband. This is what you need to be to your wife. Because even though you're married, it doesn't necessarily mean that all your problems are solved. Doesn't, right? You're married, but you're lonelier than ever because your spouse is not doing their husband or their wifely duties. You, don't, you have marriage, but you're not having that intimate relationship. And you're still in pain. You're feeling trapped in your marriage. You're tempted. So Paul says in verse 3, The husband should give this wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. Conjugal rights are basically rights to sexual relationships. You should give to your husband or give to your wife a manner, a way of living which that person had the right over when and how frequent you are to have sexual relationships according to the person's needs. So that this is a way of loving one another and caring for each other. To be more specific, Paul said in verse 4, For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Your body belongs to your husband. Your body belongs to your wife. You're to submit to the desires of your husband or your wife. Certainly, there are times where you're headache, you have headaches, you're in pain, but maybe God's called you to work through these headaches so that you can actually serve your husband or serve your wife in a way that they need to be served. It goes both ways, actually. Maybe your wife has a headache, has a pain, or is not medically able at the moment, Whatever it is, whatever she's not comfortable, she's too tired, and you can back off and say, you know what, I love you, I love your body, and I'm going to just back off for a moment because your body is important to me. Whatever, whatever it is, is to operate under love. You're operating under love, you're caring for each other, you say, do you, do you need this, do you want, you know, I would do it even though I don't feel like it, I'm going to offer it to you. On the other hand, the other side is saying, you know what, you, you, you sure? Only if it's fitting for you. So here, Paul says, love one another. Let each other have the conjugal rights to one another. Even so, even so, there may be times where you are going to split apart for a moment. Paul says this, we're not to deprive one another. That's the principle. You're not to deprive one another. You're not to play games with each other. You're not to be in argument with each other and say, you know what, because you didn't agree with me in this because I'm, in, I'm mad at you about this. I'm going to withhold this from you as a punishment for you. Paul says, do not deprive one another. Do not be separate from one another. Always be attending to each other's need in terms of frequency, in terms of that desire for one another. Care for each other the way they need to be cared for. Now, there's an exception we see in verse 5. Except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourself to prayer. Now, we do need to pray. And say, well, why do we need pray? And why do we just pray and have sexual relationships at the same time? I think there's certain reasons why you would pray and kind of abstain from that. Certainly you see in a matter of fasting when you, you could eat certainly and pray at the same time, but then you choose not to eat, right? You choose to fast on food so they could focus more on prayer. And certainly this could be an area which you could focus on prayer instead of be engaged with your husband, engage your wife in such a manner. For agreement period of time, you say, well, I'm going to pray. I'm going to focus on the Lord. Sometimes you're reading the Bible. Sometimes you're doing a Bible study. And you say, you know what, honey, not tonight. I got to finish my Bible study. We do that, and that's fine. But you say, you know what, by agreement of time. Say, not tonight, tomorrow. We'll do it so that you're not, what, tempted by Satan. You're not tempted by your evil and lack of self-control. We see this verse 5. So that when you come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of a lack of self-control. 
See, we might be mad at each other at that sometimes in this area, right? Whenever we're not together in spirit, whenever we're not having sex, we're not having that relationship, we're thinking that, you know what, maybe we're just not going to have it at all. I'm so mad at this person. I was ready, but I'm not anymore. So what? So where do you go? You're falling to the temptation of Satan because of lack of self-control. You know what? Men need to initiate. Men need to initiate in their sexual relationships. But you know what? That initiation is a lot of work. Whenever you get rejected a lot and a lot and a lot, time after time, what do you do? You stop initiating, right? You stop initiating because it's tiresome. And so what do you do when you stop initiating to your wife? You look for a place where you don't have to initiate. Where is that? Porn. That's what happens. Porn, you don't have to initiate. It's powerful. It's sometimes even more powerful than this, in the relationship you have with your wife. So when you refuse that from your husband for a prolonged period of time, you're putting your husband in a bad position. The same thing goes with the wife as well. If you don't initiate, your wife is going to what? Look for somebody who will initiate, right? You're not leading the aspect of your life. You're having an argument with your wife. You say, you know what? My wife is not this and it's not that. You're having a disagreement. You're not initiating your life. You're not initiating your sexual relationship. You're not initiating leading her. Where is she going to go find leadership? The guy down in the gym. The mailman. <laughs> right? That's where she's going to find care. That's where she's going to find attention. Someone who's going to care for her, lead her, protect her. And that's where fears happen. So do not let this go in your life. Always care for your husband. Always care for your wife so that you do not suffer the temptation because of your lack of self-control. Care for each other. It's not all about sex, but a lot of, mar- a lot of portion about marriage is about that. Have a healthy sexual relationship in a marriage setting is a healthy marriage. It is. It's a demonstration of healthy marriage. I think a good friend of mine, and he's an unbeliever, I used to work with him while I was back in the aerospace industry. I worked with him for 14 years, a friend I knew for a very long time. I watched his kids grow up. And when his kids grow up, he had this lifestyle with his family that they live in such a way that they have to spend a certain amount of money. So what do you do when the kids grow up and the wife just stay at home and not doing anything? He's an unbeliever, so you need to get back to work. You need to contribute to the family. Don't just spend all my money. Go back to work and make some money. So, they, so, so she does. They make over $150,000. $150,000 100, $150, yes. And so they have that lifestyle. But you know what happened? Their schedules are different. She comes home. He's not home. When he comes home, she's not home. So when they never see each other, and because they never see each other, what do they do? They don't have sex. And what does he do? I talked to him about this. Well, what do you do when you're just alone by yourself in your room and we don't stop in your home? Guess what? Yeah, pornography. I watch a lot of porn. That's what he says. He's not a believer. He's not a believer. So he's just being honest with me. I was like, okay, well, you know what? People don't think porn is bad anyways. He just watches it and that was it. That was his, his contentment. And you know what happened? Eventually what? And the marriage fell apart and went down the flames. I had to take him to church. I shared the gospel with him. He started going to church for a season. But then he left, and eventually his wife, he's just having these marriage problems again, over and over again. What God calls us to is this, to care for our spouse, care for our husband, care for our wives. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 and 19 says this, A lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight, being intoxicated always with her love. We're to be intoxicated with the love of our spouse. God designed for us to live in such a way. We're not designed to embrace the bosom of the adulteress. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 20 says this, Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? You should not. Instead, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15 says, We're to drink water from your own sister and flowing water from your own well. God's provided you with enough to be satisfied. Be satisfied with what God's giving you. So here we see instructions that God's given to those who are single. Instruction God's given to those who are married. If you're single, consider marriage. You're married, care for your husband, care for your wives. And the sermon can end right here, but we're not because I want to give you a final point. A final point that wraps both of them up. Because whether we're single or not, this is what we need to know. 
We're to find our contentment in the Lord. You may not have the perfect husband. You may not have the perfect wife. You may not have, you may not, you may be single. You want to be married. However way it is that you are in your life, you're to find your contentment in God and God alone. You're to consider your state of life a gift from God. This is seen in verse 6 through 7. He says, Now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of the other. Paul says, says, whether you're single, whether you're married, I need you to know this. You have a gift from God. Your gift is in your state. Who you are today is a gift from God. Now, Paul says this in verse 6. I wish that all of you is as I am. Because Paul is single at this moment. Paul is not married. We know from Scripture that he's single. He says it's blessed for me to be single. Actually, Paul likely was married at some point in his life. He's likely married at some point in his life because he was part of this group called the Sanhedrin before he was a believer. He was a Pharisee. And because he's part of that group, it's likely that he was married. But whether he was married or not, and likely he was, he's single right now. He doesn't talk about what happened to his wife. He doesn't say his wife did this or that or his wife passed away. Or maybe his wife left him because he became a believer. We don't know what reason he's single now. He's saying this in verse 6. Because I'm single, he says, I wish that all were as I myself am. There's certain benefits to singleness. There are. If you're single, you're free. You're free to do God's will more than you are when you are married. It is that way. If God tells you to go to this country right now, tonight, and you're single, you say, you know what, why not? I'll go. I'll figure it out later. I'll figure out when I get there, how I'm going to be provided for. But I'll go to do God's will. But if you're married, you're probably going to hesitate a little bit. You're going to say, well, you know what? I got to take care of my family. I got to prepare for this and prepare for that. Make sure the kids can go to school. I got to do all this type of thinking. Doesn't mean I don't go there, but it's going to be a little bit delay. So Paul says it's good that you're single because now you get to live the life which God calls you to live without any hesitation. It's a wonderful life. I'm living this wonderful life. I'm devoted to the Lord in a way that's not distracted. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32 to 33 says this. And Paul actually commends this or uh, com- commend uh, singleness in such a way. He says this, I want you to be free from anxieties. That married man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. So if you're not married about pleasing the Lord all your life, it's a good life to live. It's a gift from God. Now, if you're married, you're also having a gift from God too as well. See, married... Being married is a gift because your marriage is an example of Christ's love for the church. Your marriage is an example of the gospel message. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 says this, Husbands are to love their wives as Christ, what? Loved the church and gave himself up for her. So the very uh, very marriage that you are in is an example, is a visible manifestation for people to see what Christ's love for the church is like and and the church's love for Christ is like. So it's an example of the gospel message. And if you live that out for the Lord, you get to showcase the world the gospel message in your very living. So work on it. Consider it as a gift from the Lord. It's a wonderful gift as well. Now we have to think about this in such a way because it's contrary to other interpretations saying that there's a particular gift of singleness which a person would have, and that person have it, he would not feel any sexual urges at all. Some people interpret it to be that way. I actually don't. I don't think this passage is saying that. I think it's your state that is a gift, not necessarily whether you're having a sexual urges or not as a gift. Some people say, you know what? I have these sexual urges, so therefore I don't have the gift of singleness. You do. The fact that you're single is a gift from God. I say this because sometimes we can be mad at God, right? We say, you know what, God? I don't have the gift of singleness. I'm feeling these urges. I want to get married, but I'm not, going to get, I'm not married. God, why are you so unfair to me? You and so many other women in the world. The reality is this. There are more women Christians than there are men Christians. You go to China, you go to a church, you want to preach the gospel there. 90% of the people you're preaching the gospel to in the church are what? Women. And when they committed themselves to the Lord, they're saying, I'm going to dedicate myself to God. I'm not going to marry anybody outside of marriage. They're pretty much dedicating their whole entire lives to what? Singleness. Singleness. And God says, you need to consider that as a gift, not as a curse. Singleness is not a curse. It's a gift from God. It's a gift. Cherish it. Use it for the glory of God. 
There's one writing by Elizabeth Elliot. You know who Elizabeth Elliot is? She is the wife of Jim Elliot, and she wrote these words which were so encouraging, so encouraging to me. She wrote these words in her book, Let Me Be a Woman, published in 1976. And she was the wife of Jim Elliot, right? Jim Elliot was the one who passed away. Three years after the marriage, Jim Elliot flew into the tribe of uh, Ecuador with the Aka people, and they killed him. And she is left with a little child. She eventually went to Aka people and eventually shared the gospel with them as well. They got saved. But she stayed single for a very, very long time. Very long time. And she got married again. And her husband died again. Her second marriage and her husband died. And she wrote this, these words in her book, Let Me Be a Woman, detailing the life of being single, married, single, <laughs> widow, married, and widowed. It's a wonderful book to read. She said these things. Having now spent more than 41 years single, I've learned that it is indeed a gift. Not one that I would choose, not one many women would choose, but we do not choose our gifts, remember? We're given them by a divine maker who knows the end from the beginning and wants above all else to give us the gift of himself. Strong words. Wise words, powerful words. We don't, choose, we don't choose our destiny. We don't choose our gifts. The giver chooses our gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20 says this, We're not our own. We were bought with a price. You do not get to determine your destiny. God is the one who determines your destiny. God is the one who calls you to be single. God is the one who calls you to be married. And you're to be satisfied in Him and Him alone in the state which you are in. Because whether you're married or whether you're single, you're going to be experiencing the beauty of Christ for all eternity. Everything here on earth is only a shadow of the beauty that is to come. See, in heaven, you're going to be forever single, forever content in the Lord. In heaven, you're going to be forever the marriage bride of Christ. You're going to experience the beauty of both singleness and marriage in heaven. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 through 8 says this, that exalt and rejoice and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb had come and his bride had made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. You get to rejoice. You get to exalt in Christ because of the future that is to come, a future where you be with God forever, which is the substance of everything which we have here on earth. Everything, every good thing is only a shadow of what is to come. So given that is the case, what is our heart attitude? If you're single today, use your life for the glory of God. Don't waste your life. Don't just play video games all day long. It's a waste. There's a reason God placed you here. Don't watch TV all day long. Don't watch movies all day long. Use your singleness for the glory of God because when you get married, you're not going to have that time. Use it to read the Bible. Use it to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. Use it to teach other people about God. Use it to learn from other people. Go to school, right? Do the things that honor the Lord. Build yourself up for the kingdom of God. Use it for God's glory. And if you're married, if you're married, consider your marriage a gift from God. Sometimes we're married to a person, we don't really like the person anymore, right? Sometimes our marriages are like that. But you know what? Your marriage is not about you. It really isn't. What is your marriage about? Your marriage is about Jesus. It's about showing off Jesus in your life. If you have a husband who doesn't care for you, doesn't love you, you are going to love him in return because that's how Christ loves. That's how the church loves in return. If you have a husband who doesn't love, or you have a husband and you have a wife who doesn't love you, you still love your wife because of how Christ loves the church. You could do your part in showing off the gospel message in your marriage life. You have a calling to demonstrate God's glory in such a way. So here we see three instructions. Three instructions to both single and married. If you're single, consider marriage God's way. Be married God's way. If you're married, care for your spouse God's way. Whether you're single or married, you do find your contentment in the Lord. You are to call your state a gift from God. Because ultimately, it is only Jesus who can complete us. Not ourselves, not one another, but Jesus. In 1996, I remember it was a famous movie called Jerry Maguire. Remember that movie? It's a movie that all of us watch. And I've watched in 1996. I was in high school. I was just, you know, it's wonderful to have this kind of romantic relationship. There's a scene where Jerry Maguire tells his woman that he loved, you complete me. 
And we're like, oh, it's so wonderful. Get your tissues, paper out. You just like, cry and start to, you know, it's just a romantic scene. We're touched by it. We say, you know, I want that in my life. But you know what? As a Christian, that's actually very, very damaging for you. It really is. Theologically, that is not right. You should not hold yourself to that expectation, nor should you hold other people to that expectation. Nobody can complete you here on the side of the earth except who? Jesus. Jesus, nobody can complete you. You can look for your spouse to complete you. She will fail you. You can look for your husband to complete you. She will fa- he will fail you. You look to God. That is why we do love God above all else. My wife loves Jesus more than she loves me, and that is good. I love God more than I love her. That is good. That is good. It's what we're doing when we're single. It's what we're doing today after we're married. Because ultimately, it's only God who can satisfy us. Amen. Only God who can satisfy us. Psalm chapter 107 verse 9 says, For he satisfies the lowing soul, the hungry soul he fills with good things. We have a longing soul. We have a hungry soul. Who satisfies us? Jesus does, and only Christ. Amen? It's about word prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this message on singleness and married, marriedness, marriage. And we know, Lord, that many of us need to hear this because some of us, we don't hear this and we're kind of bought into the worldly ideology of what it means to be single and married and we are seeking after our own dreams and our own aspirations, what our lives to be like, making our own destiny. But the reality is that you're the one who make our destiny as long as we place you first. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. Help us, Lord, to practice this uh, in a way that honors you, glorifies you, and pray that there will be many people in, the, uh, in our congregation who are called to be single, to remain single, who are called to be married, but courageously step into this step of marriage uh, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.